All right. What's up, everybody? How you doing? This is Chris, and you are here. We are watching Just For My People, new interview series uh, representing Black land ownership. Oh, yeah. And uh, we're speaking to various architects, designers, project managers, uh, farmers, and people involved in land, stewardship, ownership, uh, maintenance. What do we do with the land? How are we responsible with the land? And how do we organize as community members? And today we have a special guest. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Angela Gilmore. I am an architect in Houston, Texas. I work for Rice University as the Assistant Director for Project Management and Engineering. All right, so for people out there that have no idea what that means, <laughs> can you tell them first a, uh, what you were doing as an architect and then how you end up being in project management? Okay, so um, I graduated a long time ago and I um, practiced architecture for about six solid years, like traditional practice of architecture, drawing, um, you know, buildings, creating plans, um, doing the details that are then given to contractors that they use to actually build buildings. And then the architect, of course, goes and it makes sure that the contractor is building the building according to the drawings. That's what I did for about six years. Um, within that time, I sat for my architectural registration exam, um, became a registered architect probably in the last two or three years of that. So you practice architecture for a little while before you can actually become a real architect. So I um, got, my, got my license and um, about a, a year in, they decided that they were going to get rid of the person who actually had the experience to practice architecture because quiet as it's kept, when you graduate from architecture school, you are not prepared to start sealing drawings and being responsible for anything. You do not know enough. So um, I, they, they got rid of that gentleman and I realized I needed to go do something else. So I applied for a job to be a project manager at a university, University of Houston. Um, as a project manager at the University of Houston, I didn't really know what I was going to do because it isn't something that they teach you in school in architecture. Every architect who goes to school for architecture thinks that they're going to be a designer. They're going to design buildings. Um, but I went into project management and quickly realized that project management is um, really being the owner's representative for a university. So I am the person that they call when, when anyone on the campus needs to do a renovation or new construction on campus. So um, I'm responsible for issuing requests for proposals for architects and contractors. I am responsible for um, getting those architects on board for interviews, interviewing them, selecting them for the project, um, defining the scope of the project with them, um, getting the building designed. I don't actually draw. I just direct the whole thing. Um, and then I hire the contractor and we, the architect, um, and the contractor make sure the building gets built according to everything that we told the architect we wanted to get done. So that's, that's what a project manager does. And then I pay all the bills. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so how do you go from, well, let me back up a little bit. What type of architecture were you doing and what skills were you able to transfer into doing project management? So I was doing, um, I th in my, actually I started off in urban planning um, when I was an intern, when I was in graduate school. So it was, it was really just designing um, highways, freeways. Well, not even designing highways and freeways. A civil engineer does that. It was really the, the, the aesthetic um, part of urban planning is what I, I was doing um, at HOK in Dallas. Um, I transitioned to a smaller firm in Waco where I could actually learn how to put together a set of con construction documents because, you know, if you're up too high, you may not learn all the details. So um, we did a lot of K through 12 work, um, you, know, high, you know, high schools, elementary schools, things like that. Um, and then I transitioned to an even smaller firm so I could really be responsible because I was learning that when you have people that are um, a, a lot older than you working as an architect, they won't really give you the responsibility. So I went to a firm where there were really like, there were two people there. It was like me and two other guys. 
So there was no other choice but to say, hey, Auntie, go for it. So they throw, threw me in the deep end. And we did almost anything. We were doing um, community centers, um, K through 12. My biggest project was a fire station that we did at um, Intercontinental Airport. Um, yeah. But the, the, the skills that transfer are really, um, I know how to put a set of construction documents together. So I, and, and I, the, the, the skills that you learn in architecture school translate very well into managing um, designers because you of course have an opinion that they will respect as architects because you are a fellow architect. So, um, but the thing that you don't get in school and the thing that you get as an owner's um, rep is really an appreciation for the life of a building. So when I have an architect who comes to me and says, I wanna paint everything in this building white, my response will be, you know, I've got students that live in here, right? Um, they're going to touch everything. So maybe we need to pick another color or um, they'll come up with a detail that I know is not going to, you know, work well in, in my climate because I've hired an architect who's, you know, from another country or from another city. So I can, I can bring to them that skill set that I got practicing architecture, but also under an understanding um, of the longevity and the maintenance of a building in a way that architects often don't think about. Architects really think about that, you know, glamour shot they're going to do at the end of the project, and then they never come back, and they don't really care what, it, well, let me not say they don't care. They care, but not at the level that I care, because I'm going to be the one that they call when it goes wrong. We're probably not going to call the architect when the thing breaks. We just fix it. Right. So with your experience, do you see there being community understanding um, as something that architects are told is important? Or like, I guess I'm asking because it's, I don't see the architect. Like, I don't know who designed my building where I live. Um, mm -hmm. It only became known to me when we were looking at buying land. The first thing is you have to have architect. So it's this weird thing of, we never deal with them, but they're so necessary to everything. Um, yet they don't inhabit the space once it's done. And so is it like a, fun design idea for them and then they leave it? Is it something that is really um, seen as important that like, no, people will have to engage with this. A community that's been there will have to engage with this. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I think your hope is, is that you get an architect that's thoughtful enough to recognize, you know, um, you know that, that the building has to survive after they finish. Um, but it, it also takes the, that architect having a real understanding of how they need to engage the community and they engage that community through that owner. So if you bought land and you said, I am going to build, you know, public housing, um, it would, it would, you know, it would behoove the architect to ask you, okay, do you have anybody that you think is going to live here? You know, or, or, or can you give me any examples of how this is going to be used? And, and they're going to have to work with you but you as the owner have to be interested in that as well. You know, there, there are often times where an owner isn't necessarily particularly interested in that level of detail. They're just like, hey, I just wanna throw this thing up, get some money and you know, I'm gonna let them tear it up and then I'm gonna tear it down and build another one. Um, if you're that kind of owner, then you're probably gonna get garbage if you don't care about you know, what they end up living in. But if, if the owner cares and, um, and will invest the money then the architect will do anything you need them to do. But it's, it's really completely in the hands of the owner and what they're going to allow that architect to do. The architect is only as good as, as the person that they're working for. Right. And I, I asked that um, to kind of tie in in architecture, like numerous fields that require high skill sets, representation is limited when it comes to people of color, black people specifically, and definitely black women. And these buildings go into neighborhoods. And if there are no people from these neighborhoods or there are no folks who are of African descent involved, are our needs considered or the effects on us considered? Um, which then makes me think, well, then representation would be really important. For you, what did you notice in terms of representation? I don't know if it's different in Houston because that has a, a large uh, black population, um, but were you often the only black woman architect in the room or what, what are your thoughts kind of around that? The most always the only black, arch black female architect in the room. There are only 502 black female architects in the country. 
So um, when I come across a black female architect, I'm, you know, excited. Um, I, I think that um, architects are, are more than capable of, of engaging a community, regardless of, of what their, you know, their, you know, personal demographic is. But um, I think it's, it's easier to bridge that gap when, you know, you have somebody on your team that's already a member of the community, right? I think that you find yourself, you could find yourself in a position where you are making decisions for a community um, based on what you think is best for them, rather than actually asking them what is best for you. What do you think is best for you? I think that if you have someone in your office that is in from that community or engaged in that community in some way or just able to engage in a, in a better way because they are part of that demographic, then you might end up with a better project. But I can't say that, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're not a part of the community, you're going to be an awful architect. It's, it's not necessarily, you know, going to be the case. But it's certainly, I think, would be a good thing. To, architecture absolutely needs to be diversified. And, and it, it is a thing that our, our profession is really struggling with um, because of those reasons, because of, of this, this idea that they have to hire somebody to help them engage with the community. If you had more people in your office that was a part of the community, then you'd probably be able to engage in those projects a lot more smoothly than you know, having to jump that extra hoop to get in. Uh, from, from some of the other conversations I've had with people, it seems like architecture in general is a branch or a, a field that a lot of people don't necessarily go into. And usually people that do have a certain amount of um, either wealth or coming from certain backgrounds or certain groups are encouraged more or less than others. And so that in general, it's just like a lot of people for the amount of education you have to have and how difficult it is, people would rather go to medical school. People would rather go to law school. And then within that, because you're pulling from engineering, math, kind of hard science backgrounds for a portion of architecture, there are fewer black folks. Um, I don't know if I believe that is that simple and that there aren't other barriers or people that just are saying, you don't fit a culture here, but aren't welcoming or adapting the culture. I'm not sure what it is. What do you think are some of the things that have kept architecture so homogenous? Um, you know, people say you can't be what you don't see. Um, I think it's more complicated than that. I had never seen a black female architect and it was not a, a barrier for me. I think that, um, it's more of if you don't know what it is, then you won't be interested in it, right? If you've never really heard of it or, you know, I, I don't think you need to see one, but I think you need to have heard of it, right? I think you, you need to have had, had some inkling about what it is. And I would say that architecture is, in my experience, a very elitist um, profession. Um, it is it is something that the, the common man, the average bear, doesn't necessarily come in contact with. Something you said earlier, if if you if you don't have any connection to it, then it might just be a word in your life, and you don't really have any idea what it is. And why would you want to be something that you have no idea what it is? Like I don't know what a physicist does. So I probably am not going to become a physicist, right? Now, if somebody were to explain to me that, oh, that's an awesome thing. I don't think I need to see a black physicist. I just think that thing was awesome. I think architecture doesn't do a very good job of advertising itself. So that's what, the, that's what architecture is actually trying to do, too. They're trying to, you know, make, make it, make themselves more visible and, and make it a thing that people are more aware of and um, really stop giving the prof profession away to contractors and developers because i think that's another thing that's happening it's getting to a place where you don't people don't think they need architects you can just have a draftsman and then you can have you know your developer go build your house i don't know how many like architects don't do a whole lot of designing of homes they do custom homes for wealthy people but you know the average bear who buys a house in a neighborhood in houston buys it from a developer from a set of plans, a book of plans that, you know, who knew, who knows who drew. Right. 
Great. Wow. Um, in terms of as you've stepped into your role as project manager um, and dealing with contractors, dealing with architects, dealing with different uh, folks, is it difficult finding black contractors? Is it difficult finding folks that have the, the skill sets and the level of experience that you need uh, to be able to bring them in on jobs? Or is it really, there are, there are people in the sphere, it's just finding folks that fit the right job or how, how do you look at that? I think it's, it's all that, all that you said. I think that um, if you are doing a, a, you know, a, a really, really big project, um, people are often interested in giving that, you know, that, that, you know, million square foot building with a ridiculously high, um, you know, um, fee associated with it to a firm that has experience doing that kind of work. And nine times out of 10, um, it is not going to be a minority architect who's ever been giving the experience to do that. Um, is it hard to find people? Um, no, I think you can find them. I think though, as a client, like Rice University being a client, I think you have to be interested in hiring someone to do a project, you know, for the university based on diversity. You have to be deliberate in it. Um, we actually just hired an architect, his name is David Adje, um, to do um, our new student center at Rice. It's the only project of any significance at Rice that's ever been uh, where we've ever hired a minority architect, uh, well, a black architect. Um, and I say that only because I'm thinking now there is one other project, it's nowhere near as large and we have um, given it to an Asian architect. But it's before that, there are people that we know, people that we're accustomed to, to hiring and most of them, if not all of them have been, you know, black, I mean, white male owned companies. Right. Um, people stick to what they're comfortable with. Um, so yeah, you can. They're they're out there. I mean, I I I have a long list. I'm I'm very active in the National Organization of Minority Architects, so um, I can find black-owned architecture firms, you know, everywhere. But are they going to have the skills that the university is looking for? Maybe not. Um, are they capable? Certainly. But um, you know, is is the client? willing to take a chance if they haven't done this particular kind of project before. Right. It seems to be a cycle or something I've noticed in a number of professions of you need experience to get the experience. <laughs> and, and at some point there is a gap in that where someone takes a chance on somebody or someone says, you know, there's this talent that we've heard of. They may not have done it before, but we can afford to do that. And, that tends to involve whether it's nepotism or kind of friend groups or kind of networking associations. Um, do you see there being effort from more, I guess, older, more traditional, larger firms that may not be so diverse to try to reach out and, and make connections, mentoring programs, professional development programs with young black architects? So, um, these firms, I would, I would say, you know, for the last 10, 20 years have been, you know, talking about it. There's like, yeah, we got to diversify. We got to do this, that, and the other. I don't know that they have been, you know, diligently working at it. Um, I can say that they probably haven't because I know when there was an effort to get, when gender became an issue and they wanted more women in the field, all of a sudden there are more women in the field, right? Um, I haven't, seen in, you know, a five-year study, there being, you know, two black people and all of a sudden now we've got 10. It's not, it's, it's not happening that way. But uh, 2020 is a different year, right? And 2020, I think may have kicked everybody into, you know, high speed on dealing with diversity and inclusion. Um, the AIA, the American Institute of Architects have just, you know, gone kind of gangbusters. They're all in on diversity and inclusion now. My hope is, is that continues. Um, but it, there seems to be an interest in it now. Um, the, National, the National Organization of Minority Architects 
have, um, it's become far more popular than it's ever been in its history because of this desire to diversify and the recognition that we are the place where you can come to find, um, you know, these minority architects, the students that are coming out of HBCUs. Um, we've actually started a program um, through NOMA called the um, HBCU Professional Development Program, where we have reached, we have, we have contacted, or we reached out to what they call the LFRT, the um, Large Firm Roundtable with the AIA, and got them pretty much to commit to hiring a group of students, right, to, to come into their firms. So we're going through a process of making those connections, talking about networking, just like you said. Um, but I think the schools and our community in general need to do a better job of educating young people about the value of networking. Because I think that's the thing that's missing. Um, I was not taught that I needed to know people, right? No one, when I went to college, no one told me, you really need to be the most popular person here if you're going to be successful. It is a thing that I'm teaching my children that when you meet somebody who's in the field that you're interested in, they need to remember you. So you need to make sure that you make a friend because every other community understands that except for ours. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, coming from an art background, there's almost a dichotomy or like a pull between folks that are insular and they sit in their painting studios and they make really amazing stuff. But then there's something worked out for that. Uh, if they don't like going out in public, they get a manager, they get an agent, they get someone that will do that interpersonal networking and get them in the place where job opportunities come up. Uh, and it seems like if you're in something like architecture, you don't have that bridge. It's like you are going to have to be the face of yourself and do the, whether it's the, the internships or doing the extracurricular activities or the volunteer work or the design contest or what have you, to be put in the rooms with people that will give you opportunity in the future. Yeah, but I don't think it's just architecture. It's like, I, I really feel like it's our community as a whole that, that, that we kind of sit back and have this expectation that things are going to come to us the way they come to other people without recognizing that other um, communities have a built-in network. They've got a grandfather who's gonna introduce them to someone in the firm and then they end up getting a job, whatever it is, a lawyer, a doctor, they know somebody. That's how they get those jobs. They're not just special. They're just walking in white, getting a job. That's not what that is. That is, I know everybody in here. I know somebody who knows somebody. We need to start to get to know somebody. Wow. That, that's really informative and, and something I'm, I'm glad you addressed. Um, in terms of what you're doing now for the, the university, how do you see that growing and developing? Is this something you'd like to do for uh, kind of ongoing in your career? Is this a, a part of a larger plan? So I, I honestly have never real been, been real deliberate in anything that I do. I find things that I like. I'm, I'm really passionate about a particular thing and I just kind of go down that rabbit hole for a little while. What I'm doing now um, is trying to be a little more deliberate and think about what my future um, is. So I am right now considering getting a ed doctorate um, in higher administration so I can stay in um, higher ed, but advance in my department to become the director you know, of project management, to become the associate VP of facilities um, but I would ultimately like to get back to what I always thought I wanted to be, and that was an architecture professor. Um, so that ed doctorate, my hope is, is that in the next 10 years, I can transition back to going back to my HBCU, Prairie View A&M University, and, and, and just give him back. You know, in, 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 my, in my last 10 years of my career, I would, ra I would like to be back there teaching those students what I did not learn when I was there. Right, right, and shout out to HBCUs. I, I grew up on Howard's campus and I went to Morehouse. So, you know, shout out to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and to go back to something you had said, I, I think it's really important, A, to inspire the young folks and to fill in the gaps um, and the areas that where maybe we weren't given some of the, the influence or information. Um, in tech, often you'll have folks say, well, we don't have a lot of black people because 
there aren't a lot of black engineers or computer scientists or programmers, or we don't have a lot of women for the same thing. And when I'm like, yeah, you realize there's schools like Barnard College where it's all women, are you recruiting out of them? You realize that there are HBCUs all over the country, are you recruiting out of them? And you watch these people's faces and they're kind of like, huh? Mm -hmm. um, what can be done, do you think, to connect these worlds a bit more? So like for, to, to get these universities connected with some of these firms and people in these firms aware that these universities and opportunities exist. And young people to know that they may have to be a bit more proactive uh, mm -hmm. than some other communities. Yeah. Well, that's what this HBCU program is that we put together. Um, our, our first um, meeting with these students is really like a speed networking opportunity. We got like 20 firm, 25 firms to meet with 100 architecture students from seven um, of the HBCUs where we have schools of architecture. Um, they do this speed mentoring opportunity. And then we're just checking in with the students between November and January to say, are you talking to those people? Have you called them? We're asking the firms, have you talked to the students? All, are you communicating? Are you talking about your resumes and your portfolios? So they then go into a career fair in January so they can meet again. And then we'll have another meeting in March to talk to them again. And then in January, well, in, in May, June, when it's time to hire them, we're gonna be, did you hire anyone, right? But we're making that connection in that program with these large firms. Um, and then beyond that, our plan is to then say, okay, now that they're in your firm, we need you to mentor them so they stay because the culture of architecture firms are such that, um, let me make it really make you feel like, you know, they want you to stay, right? So these students need to also be taught that when you're asked to go out to lunch with a group of people that you don't know, you need to go. Yeah. You need to become friends with these people in these firms. But this program that I'm talking about is specifically planned or specifically um, um, created only for these seven HBCUs where 30% of the black architects come from. Right. Um, the thing is that that means there's 70% that are coming from other schools of architecture all over the country. So, you know, the, the next step, and, and one of the things that I spoke about, I did a, um, a talk at Rice, is to make sure that these schools of architecture, and we've had this conversation with the American Institute of Architects, but these schools of architecture need to recognize that this thing that we do as architects, and I probably didn't tell you this, we weed students out of our programs the first year. It's, it's not this cohort of we're going to bring you through this program. It's we're going to make your lives as miserable as humanly possible for the, this year to, I guess, decide whether or not you really want to stay. So you can start with an architecture program that's got like 30, 40 people in it. By the end, you're graduating 10. And it, it, you can't do that, especially in a PWI, when you've got two black students, right? Because they already don't feel like you want me here. And now I walk into this program that's really making, making me feel like I'm not wanted. So they leave, right? Let me go do something else. I'm not even gonna get paid very much as an architect. Why would I do this? Like you said earlier, you make more money doing something else. So why would I abuse myself? So I think it's, it's really a culture shift that needs to happen in these, these schools. Um, our, like I said, our program is, is, is really focused on connecting HBCUs to these firms so we can get them you know, to that place. But there's another 70% of, of the, the graduating um, black architects that if they don't change the architecture programs, you're going to lose 70%. Wow. Do yeah. you feel like even once you finish school, because I, I may have this wrong, but if I remember Howard's architecture program is five years, um, it's grueling. The mm -hmm. final project drives people nuts. Mm -hmm. It is a, we want to rinse you early like like part of it is look to your left look to your right some of y'all aren't going to be here so mm -hmm. make sure if you want to be here you're ready to put in the work or what have you mm -hmm. um but once you then get your you finish you get your degree 
it's not like you're licensed yet to then be able to sign documents. You still have another process of, in a way, being an apprentice. And mm -hmm. you're not like you're, you're a professional. You, you, you have your degree. You're, you're working. But is there during that time period a kind of welcoming or still kind of like you do grunt work. And if you can't hack it, you don't make it to the next level of being licensed and then one day possibly being a principal owner or starting your own firm or what have you. Yeah, it depends on where you land. It depends on what firm you're in and what culture they have there. If um, you are able to, you know, um, you know, weave yourself into their culture, then you're, you'll, you will probably be fine. Um, it just doesn't always happen. Um, I, I said earlier, I started off at HOK in Dallas. I didn't feel like I was welcome there. Now, I didn't do anything to make them even notice me, right? So it's not all them. I didn't go out there when they asked me to go to lunch. I didn't, I didn't well, I did with my planning group, but the, the design group and the architecture group where I was probably supposed to go after I graduated, I didn't make any connections there. Um, they didn't make any connections with me. Um, so that's why I, I, I didn't stay. Um, but yeah, it's that, it, that, it's that three years that if you, um, you know, you don't hack it, they're, they're not necessarily going to be pulling you along. It's like more hazing. It's like you went through the five years of school, you get hazed there, still not in the fraternity. Then I go to my three years, still not in the fraternity. You finally take that exam and that's when you go over. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But then you still you know, you could still find yourself in a firm where they're not, you know, they're not appreciative and they don't, they don't take good care of you and don't make you feel, you know, like, like you want to, you know, you want to stay. But at this point, I think you've gotten so far in that you're probably not going to leave. You do what I do. You go into project management for, for something else. You leave the traditional practice. Right. Right. What are some of the fields people go into that may have started in architecture and have had, you know, five, 10 years experience? What are some things they can do with that? I would say for the most part, they end up in hospital districts, they end up in school districts, they end up at school, like higher education, um, universities. Um, a lot of people end up at the city of Houston or some municipality, a county, county offices, all of these groups that have facilities kind of, well, not facility, yeah, everyone who has facilities department, this is where an architect can find themselves or um, planning departments, it, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of the graduates from Prairie View are down working at the city of Houston, which works out really well for me when I need a permit. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I know so little about that side of things. Again, being an artist, renter, when we started looking at property, it's like, all right, here's a tax map, go find out stuff. And I'm like, what do, what do you mean go find out stuff? And my partner's like, I don't know, figure it out. What, what are we going to need to do? Like, what are the building codes in that particular municipality versus upstate New York versus this, this county? And I'm sitting there like, you just call? And then, yeah, it's like these lists of offices and you end up on the phone and really quickly you meet all the people. Yeah. And you realize that, again, it's friendships, it's relationships. It's you call the office and no one's heard of your name before. Hmm, it might be a week, two weeks before certain things get back to you. You call and you've been nice and you've had a good relationship with certain people. All of a sudden it's like, well, we normally don't do this, but I can just go downstairs and pull that file and look for you and send you a copy. And it's like, oh, there's a downstairs. The other person didn't even tell me, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that's, this has been really insightful. Before we, we finish up, I would want to ask you, uh, what are your feelings about people of African descent owning more land or its importance in terms of generational wealth building or being able to control your own space? Like, do you have any thoughts or feelings about this? Well, of course, I think it's important. I think it's, you know, it's uh, the third ward here in Houston. Um, most of the people in, in that neighborhood, I would say are, are renter or maybe not renters. They, they are, are maybe a generation removed from the people who owned the property. Um, but not necessarily dead set on staying. Um, so slowly but surely, um, gentrification is happening in Third Ward. People are moving out to the suburbs, really with very little protest, right? The, the idea is if you live in, in Houston proper, it is more expensive. 
you move outside of the loop um, into the suburbs and you can get a whole lot of house for very little money. So you move. Um, I wish I had property, you know, inside the loop. And I wish more people of color had property inside the loop. If they did, it would probably trickle down more into our community, right? If we own the land, we could hire architects of color, we could hire contractors of color, um, we could probably, you know, build, build buildings that would house and employ people um, of color. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's a really important thing, but I think we need to be educated in it. I think that we as a community are a community of spenders and, and renters. And I want, the, I want the nicest thing for the least amount of money right now. Um, and and I, I think it's, it's an education. It's a, it's a thing that we have to teach our, our, our children that if you've got $50,000, don't go buy a Cadillac, go buy a, a lot, right? Um, it's just not, I, I don't think that, that we as a community have been educated to invest as much as, as we should. And I think, you know, if, if, if we, you and I can teach our children and, and their, you know, their children's children, I think that we, we can become landowners again. We just, we got to start somewhere. Yeah. I, well, I, I leave the children and passing on information to them to you. <laughs> but I think uh, something we were interested in with Black land ownership is as artists and as people that historically don't tend to be owners. We, we tend to be folks that are renting space. We tend to not have the capital. Um, when I started looking into the reality of like, wait, you can get land for how much? And even though you have to get a land or agricultural loan, so you're not going to you know, get it for 10% down. You'll still need some upfront cash. People who've been living in cities don't realize how much money they spend. And mm -hmm. so there are artists I'm around who have spent tens of thousands of dollars on camera gear, on recording equipment, on their painting studio. If I think about how much rent money I've spent living in Brooklyn the past 12 years. Mm -hmm. I know. You, you'd be a millionaire. I mean, you, yes. you, don't, have to, you don't have to city. <laughs> well, I, and so part of what we're trying to do is encourage folks and let them know it is accessible and it may be starting small. It may be you and your friends going up on a lot. Um, I think by being in architecture and in project management, you're, you probably have access to innovative ways people are able to generate capital or accumulate capital or get funds. As individuals, we're not taught how to work collectively, at least I, where I grew up, we weren't taught how to work collectively. So when I told a lawyer, hey, me and my five art friends want to buy a property, first thing the lawyer says is don't buy property before other people. It's too much of a headache. Well, then I started learning about real estate investment trusts, and it's like, wait, over 100 people are invested in it, and they have control over the commercial entities that happen. We could use those in urban areas to fight gentrification if we are involved, because the development's going to happen. We, we're not going to be able to stop the developers in New York. But if we're able to say, you know what, we are co-owners in this, this is what our community needs. But no one told me eight years ago, you realize you and 200 of your friends can actually co-own space. And there's a, a method, there's a legal entity for it, and there's a history. These, ho these hotels, these hospitals, they're not owned by an individual. It's groups of people. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I mean, it's investing. I mean, you, get, you buy stock. You're not the only one that owns that stock. There's thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that own it. It doesn't hurt anybody for you to be part owner of anything. Right, right. Wow, that's great. All right. Well, um, before we wrap up, is there anything you would like to share with us or, or anything you'd like to let people know? No, I think, I think that's it. <laughs> Perfect. And how can people find you? Let's say um, there are some folks who would like, who, who run a firm or like, um, are interested in learning more how they can tap into the HBCU network? How can people find you? So I would tell you that you can find me on LinkedIn. Now, I'm not going to tell you what my, I don't, I don't know what my LinkedIn whatever is, but my name is Angela Gilmore. It's down here on the screen. You can probably Google me and find me in any number of places. <laughs> okay, amazing. And thank you very much. Uh, this has been 
just for my people. We're here speaking about land, project management, the field of architecture. And thank you again to our wonderful guests. Uh, Ms. Gilmore and Zilla, I, I, I want to be respectful and just say thank you. Okay. <laughs> Angela, thank you. Um, okay. And enjoy your wonderful evening. All right. Thank you. You too. All right. Peace. Okay. Bye-bye.